Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion, Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 210. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jujitsu approach. And I'm back today with a returning champion of the podcast. I got Mr. David Lay. How's it going, Dave? It's been a while. It's been a while. Thanks for having me. Yeah, last time you were on, we had an awesome talk about depression. I guess not not an awesome <laughs> subject, but it, it was an awesome talk for sure. It was very timely too, because of course we were in the middle of a pandemic at the time, and I think all of us were a little bit depressed. Today, I wanted to pick your brain about something completely different, talking about habits, talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. We've had a bunch of sports psychologists and sports researchers on recently who have brought up some really awesome ideas and something that keeps coming up is CBT, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy. And I thought, you know what? Would be really awesome to just get someone on the freaking horn here who understands the stuff and can talk about it. And man, I immediately thought of you, Dave. Well, thank you. (laughs) No problem. So with that said, why don't you tell me, give yourself a quick intro. I know that you've been on here before, but it's been a while. So maybe just tell everyone who you are and what you're all about. Sure. I'm a clinical psychologist based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm also an author and a sex therapist. I do a lot of training and a lot of media about sexuality issues. And then I'm a a black belt in jiu-jitsu, Gracie Baja School under Roberto Alencar, and uh, been training... Been training jujitsu about 17 years now, I guess. You know, I'm just waiting for an excuse to figure out a way to get you on here to talk about sex therapy. I just, I'm not sure how to really tie that into jujitsu, but I'm really looking forward to that one day. Well, yeah, I mean, I, it's funny when you talk about CBT online, CBT therapists have to, um, I think, I think they use the hashtag CBT now, because if you just use the hashtag CBT, all this kinky sex stuff comes up. Fascinating. Well, that's the internet, right? I mean, it has a tendency to just, the kinky sex stuff just kind of is like a feature, not a bug. It just, on the (laughs) internet, it just manages to get involved into everything, right? It it does. It pulls people in. (laughs) Well, maybe this is as good an intro as any here. I mean, I'm bringing this up because, as you know, this is a a hot topic right now. In the jujitsu world, there's a a lot of emphasis on modern coaching techniques, and uh, CBT often comes up in relation to that discussion. Uh, But also, as you know, like habit forming is big right now. There's a lot of uh, pop psych books on how to build good habits. Like people keep talking about things like uh, atomic habits, right? Comes up over and over again. And so CBT is kind of top of everyone's mind. It's been mentioned on the podcast before, but we've never actually talked about it and explained what it is. So with that said, I mean, I'd love to turn the mic over to you here. And why don't you introduce cognitive behavioral therapy and like tell us what it is what it isn't where it's good where it's bad and how you use it too i would love to know sure so cognitive behavioral therapy is is really a bit of an offshoot of behaviorism behaviorism if you think about skinner skinner was the the psychologist with the rats right who showed that we can condition and teach people and animals to engage repetitively, you know, in certain behaviors with certain cues. So we can, we can influence people's behavior and through, through processes of, you know, Pavlov with ringing the bell, right. And making the dog by consistently pairing the ring of the bell with giving the dog a treat was able to then make the dog salivate just at the sound of the bell. That's poor kind of behavioral conditioning or behaviorism. Cognitive behavioral therapy was was a a follow-up to that. Beck, Aaron Beck was really the the progenitor of of cognitive behavioral therapy. He passed away just um just a few months ago um at a ripe old age. But in the 1960s roughly, Beck started introducing the idea that we could pair 
thoughts and, and cognitions, our thinking with our behaviors in order to start to shift how people both behave and feel. The real core concept behind cognitive behavioral therapy is really rooted in the premise that how we think affects how we behave and how we feel, and how we behave in influences how we think and feel. So, so it's a two-way street, and so, so it kind of comes at it from two different directions. One cognitive behavioral therapy explores the beliefs that people have about the world, for instance, or the, or the things that they think about the world. So if, if you go into a jujitsu match, for instance, thinking that you're going to lose, right? You know, we all know guys that, you know, as the match, you know, starts, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll kind of jokingly say, oh, you know, don't hurt me or, you know, I, I know you're going to kick my ass. Let, let's see how, how quick you how quick you can submit me. Well, that approaching, you know, the match with that thought in your mind affects how you're going to behave, affects how, you know, the, your ability to, to perform, to succeed. Which is one reason why I think, you know, a lot of coaches really encourage folks to go into a match, you know, with a a confident mindset, right? A, you know, competitive mindset. So it also works the other way around, though, that how we behave actually impacts our the way we think. So a good example of this that I often use with patients and folks I work with is that if you right now smile, you're not feeling particularly happy, but if I ask you to smile and hold a smile for 15 seconds, research actually indicates that when we have people do this, it improves their mood slightly, but measurably. That if we have somebody smile even when they're not happy, after smiling for 15 seconds, they actually report that they are measurably happier than they were before they smiled. And, you know, what's what's the theory behind that? The theory behind that is is a couple of things. One is that it is, again, kind of a behavioral conditioning kind of thing that we smile when we are happy. And so if we smile, we feel happier because we associate that behavior with that feeling. Also, though, it, it is kind of like a little bit of a mental trick that as you smile, your brain is, is kind of thinking, right? You know, let, let's talk for our brain for a minute. Your brain is thinking, well, I'm not feeling happy, but I'm smiling. I smile when I'm happy. I must be happier than I think. Smiling also in that kind of framework is going to trigger some of the you know neurochemistry and some of the neuro brain activity that happens when we are happy and so again it's going to trigger some of the emotions and thoughts in response to the behavior clinically when we have somebody who is depressed for instance the cognitive behavioral therapy strategy and it sounds stupid but the cognitive behavioral therapy strategy is to act as though you are not depressed, to do the things that you would do when you're not depressed. So if when you're not depressed, you are more likely to go out and socialize, you're more likely to go out and exercise, then when you're depressed, you need to do those things. And it kind of creates a, a behavioral cascade in your body and in your brain that starts to shift you back towards being not depressed. So cognitive behavioral therapy is really about working both ends of the spectrum, using our thoughts to affect our behavior, but also trying to use our behavior to affect the way we feel and think. Yeah, it makes a, a lot of sense. And maybe it's a bit counterintuitive to think that way too, because I know for me, when I first heard about this, it kind of, you know, surprised me that this is actually how the mind and the body work together. You know, we always think in our, in our heads that our brain is kind of like the computer that controls your body, right? And it's sort of the decision maker and your body just does what the brain tells you to. But the interesting thing about CBT is it kind of brings back to light the fact that, look, the brain 
it's just an organ. It's a, a very important organ, but ultimately it's part of your body and it's not completely in control all the time. You know, yes, it can send orders to the rest of your body, but sometimes the things that happen in your body also can impact your brain itself. And that's a really interesting realization that the, you know, the brain is not your, your manager, so to speak, where it's dictating what your body does, but that it's kind of a two-way relationship between the mind and the body and that they're part of one ecosystem and they can, they can impact each other based on what they do. Yeah. There's a, a great book written in the nineties called Descartes' Error. And, you know, Rene Descartes was the philosopher in the, uh, let me see, 17 or 1800s, I think, who posited, you know, the mind-body split and suggested, you know, that we we are distinct from, from our body. And really, a lot of modern kind of confusion about humans comes from that separation the belief that we are somehow separate from our body. But the thing is that, you know, we are our body. And yet, you know, our body is doing things. You know, my, my appendix is doing stuff right now. And I don't know what the, what the hell my appendix is doing. And I have absolutely no conscious control of what my appendix is doing. We think and, and we're like, well, OK. But then we think, well, I can control my brain. Really? Can you? Because... There are thoughts that happen that we don't control or create. When I walk up to a soda machine, I don't sit there and debate, you know, do I want the lemony, lime, refreshing taste of, of Sprite or do I want that kind of acidic, carbolic taste of Coke? No, I just walk up, I put money in and I push the button. And, the, re and the, the button that I push is influenced by what button I pushed last time, by what people that I respect drink, what the last commercial I saw was, right? And it's all this kind of behind-the-scenes programming stuff. We, again, cognitive behavioral therapy is really working on that stuff. And it's saying, it, it, it's recognizing that a lot of what we do and think and feel is not all that conscious. Now, you know, Freud argued this, and, and it's really interesting that, you know, Freud talked about the unconscious. And in behavioral, in cognitive behavioral world, we're really kind of talking about the same stuff. We don't talk about it as explicitly and we don't we don't refer to the consciousness, but instead we we might refer to a learning history. And it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love that example you brought up about how you, you can't actually control your thoughts. And I remember that being a big realization for me. It was something that I, you know, I learned about when I started studying mindfulness practice. One of the things that I, I've heard a bunch of people in that space say is, you know, it's a losing battle to try to stop your thoughts. It's basically impossible because your brain is kind of an organ, much like the other organs you brought up. It's going to do its thing. <laughs> and yeah. your ability to kind of prevent it from doing its thing is kind of hard. My favorite example of that is the uh, the pink elephant problem, right? Where if I tell you, don't think of a pink elephant you can't help it but to think of a pink elephant, right? You you can't stop that from happening by putting that idea into your head. Even if I'm trying to do it in the negative sense, now your brain is going to conjure up that picture and that's just the way that it is. And one of the lessons from mindfulness practice is rather than trying to stop the thinking that you don't want, you kind of have to come to terms with it and, and learn to sort of put a bit of distance between yourself and your thoughts rather than trying to stop them from happening. And I, I think that's an interesting example of how, yeah, your brain is an organ. It's going to do its thing. And what it does is also in a lot of ways tied to your body, your environment, your conditioning. There's a lot of factors beyond just you think something and it happens. And I find that so fascinating. Yeah. And the, you know, it's funny, I'll bring up, you know, a sexuality issue because I think it's pretty relevant, right? We're in November right now, and there's this online, you know, kind of idiocy, frankly, I call it, you know, quote, no nut November. And it's these, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy that we found a way to work this into this conversation. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. You might have to cut this out. There's this online cult um, of people 
that argue that, you know, by refraining from masturbation and engaging in semen retention, that they become more masculine, they become more in control of themselves, they become stronger. And the reality is absolutely the reverse. The reality is that they are likely decreasing their testosterone. They are likely, you know, potentially even harming themselves because sexuality and orgasms are actually really, really healthy. But what's interesting is that there's now research coming out looking at these people and these online groups that that try to encourage each other to, you know, abstain from masturbation. And what we're finding is that that goal of abstinence actually increases distress and makes makes people feel worse because an abstinence goal and this and this relates to CBT, an abstinence goal is unfortunately, pretty likely to be one that you're going to fail. And especially when you set the benchmark of abstinence at a, at a very low level. And so, for instance, you know, people that try to not masturbate, the more they try not to masturbate and the more they try not to think about masturbation, the more they think about it. Because they, they're they teaching their mind that this thing, thinking about masturbation, is very salient. Well, your your mind doesn't know that that is good or bad. Your mind just knows, hey, I am putting a lot of attention and energy to this thought, so it must be important. I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to bring it back more. So we get this spiral of of people then thinking about the thing that they're trying not to think about. And and then getting more and more distressed about it. And that, frankly, is really, really bad therapy. As a therapist, and, and I use a lot of CBT, I am actually gravitated a bit more towards a model called acceptance and commitment therapy, and I can talk about that. But in a good therapeutic approach to that, I'm not going to tell a person, don't think about masturbation. I'm not going to tell a person, don't think about something, because I know it's actually going to incentivize the reverse. It's going to be paradoxical. Instead, I try to help them think about other things. So I don't know if you remember the show MacGyver. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember MacGyver, both the old and the new one. Yeah, yeah. There's a new one? Oh, God, I missed that. Okay. I, I don't know if it ever came out, but I thought there was discussion about rebooting that show. Oh, wow. I may be wrong. Um, so I actually am not very good at meditation. As you just said, it's really hard for me to kind of get my brain to go quiet. And I used to have really significant sleep problems. And I would find, you know, I'd be thinking about you know, I'd be beating myself up for not not being able to fall asleep. I'm thinking, you know, I'm watching the clock. Oh my God, I've got five hours to sleep, four hours to sleep, and I'm getting myself all stressed out. So I remembered this episode of MacGyver where he described that one summer as a kid, he, quote, built a castle in his head, but it wasn't like he just thought, boop, okay, there's a castle. Instead, he thought through All of the way, you know, how he would quarry the stone, how he would transport the stone to the site, how he would design the castle, how he would build the castle brick by brick. Well, I do woodworking and I do jujitsu. And and I found that when I woke up in the night and I was having trouble sleeping, rather than trying to not think about work or not think about stressful stuff. Instead, I would fill my brain up with woodworking or with jujitsu. And I would I would think about my last matches and I would remember the move and I would think about how you know how it went and I would try and replay it in my head. Or um I would think about a, a woodworking project I'm working on and I would I would think about the designs and the joints and the way I would plane the wood. And again, I would I, I'm filling my brain up with stuff that is calming to me, stuff that doesn't stress me out, doesn't that helps me relax. And in the midst of that, I fall asleep. So meditation for me is not about, it's closer to kind of mindfulness. It's not about not thinking about anything, but instead it's about being intentional about the things I'm thinking about because I know how the things I think about affect the way I feel. That's really fascinating. I mean, I love these examples too of like how hard it is to to think in the negative sense, you know, to think, don't do this, don't do that. I read a goal setting book recently where their advice was 
to not set negative goals for yourself. So for example, if you're trying to, to lose weight and get in shape, a bad goal would be don't eat sugar for the reasons you brought up. But a better goal might be to visualize yourself and think of yourself as an athlete and to think like I am an athlete and my goal is to live like an athlete and to focus on phrasing your goals in a, in a positive affirming sense versus in a negative don't do this type sense. Yeah, we as humans, we are better at <laughs> starting new things than stopping bad things. So, you know, when I see somebody who is struggling with with some problem behavior in their life, I don't try to get them to stop that behavior. Instead, I do a couple of things. One, I try to figure out what function that behavior is performing in their life? What are they getting out of it? Because we don't, even negative behaviors, we get something out of it. It is serving some function. There is some reinforcement. It is taking care of something for us. And so I want to understand what the function of that behavior is, because if it is, for instance, you know, something that is soothing to you or helping to distract you from anxiety, then I want to now help you come up with other ways that you can cope with those negative feelings. And then I don't tell you not to do that problem behavior. Instead, I try to help you practice those other strategies first. We try to replace, you know, those negative behaviors rather than stop the negative behavior. And oftentimes that is one of the strategies where we, we just make those problems again, less energized. You know, I'm not, I'm not a woo woo guy, but Deepak Chopra, you know, said, famously said that which you give your attention to grows. That, that right there is cognitive behavioral therapy. Because now it directs us to pay attention to the things we want more of and ignore, whenever possible, the things we want less of. Give energy to the things that you, that you want to have more energy and be more important in your life. Awesome. Amazing. I, I love that thought of kind of focusing on the positive and setting your goals in that way. And I mean, if I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of someone listening to this, probably their next question is going to be, okay, I'm a jujitsu athlete. Like what can I do actionably to kind of apply CBT to build better habits, to, to be a better grappler and to have, to have more fun on the mats? I mean, we've already told everyone that they should definitely start masturbating frequently beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to increase your testosterone, you know. And, and, and one of the one of the big things is to pay attention to your self talk and the things that you're telling yourself about about jujitsu, about your performance on the map. And if you find yourself thinking, "Oh, you know, I'm I suck at this. I'm never going to get better." you know, I can't beat this guy. I can't get this move. Challenge yourself. And and unfortunately, you know, Stuart Smalley on Saturday Night Live ruined this for everybody, you know, by, you know, when um, Al Franken was playing Stuart Smalley and, and he's standing in front of the, the mirror telling himself, you know, you're, you're a nice guy. People like you. You're attractive. People want to be around you. And it sounds really, really stupid. But there's a little bit of validity in there that if we can change some of those thoughts, if we can pull back, and you don't have to be thinking, you know, you're the best jujitsu guy in the world. Instead, if you can pull back and say, okay, I don't have to get it exactly right, but if I can do it a little bit better than I did last time, that's how I keep moving. You know, most of us, I think, in jujitsu, you know, we, we go through plateaus, right? You know, where, you know, you, you all of a sudden find yourself just kind of static. You're not making a lot of progress. Guys that you used to be, you know, are submitting you and you just can't seem to stop them. And you can't seem to make progress. When that happens to me, I slow down. And the way I slow down is by resetting my expectations. So then when I go into jujitsu, I'm not thinking I need to beat everybody. I'm not thinking I need to submit anybody. 
I'm not thinking I need to not get submitted. Instead, I decide, okay, there's this one move I'm going to work on today. And if I even get to the point where I try to hit that move, I win. It's a win day because that was my goal. And if I'm able to get the move, oh my God, it's a huge win. That's amazing advice. And the thing I love about that too is in addition to helping frame a positive mindset, it also helps you goal set and and go into class with the purpose for training, right? I think too many people, you know, jujitsu is kind of this intoxicating thing where it's a fun physical activity. So a lot of people go just for fun and they don't put a lot of thought into it, right? They kind of just go and they just want to roll, which is great, right? But at the end of the day, if you're deliberate about your practice, it's going to make it easier for you to develop skills. And so I always tell people, go in and have a goal with each class that you want to achieve. And it doesn't need to be some big world changing goal. Like I want to tap out all the black belts or anything, or, you know, it, it can be something much smaller and often it should be something that is within your control, right? I don't like going in and setting goals. Like I'm going to tap all of my instructors or anything like that. I mean, first of all, I think that brings the wrong mindset into practice, but also it's a goal that it can often sort of be out of your control in a lot of ways. I prefer to go in and say, Hey, look, I think my, you know, I think my butterfly guard sucks. So today my goal is I'm just going to try to get into and play butterfly guard. I'm going to steer into that position, even if I'm not super comfortable there and just try to make a habit out of it. And yeah, I can come out of that feeling better because even if I went to butterfly guard and then I immediately got smashed, I mean, I still fulfilled my goal. I focused my training on a thing that was productive. And the fact that I got smashed gives me experience that helps me get better at the goal. So I found that kind of chomping out those achievable, positive, doable goals that you can control really, really helps out, at least for me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and and it is... It is some of that positive mindset, you know, I mean, Edison, you know, famously said, you know, he tried 500 different times before he was able to make a functioning light bulb. And people are like, oh, well, you failed 500 times. No, he says, I was successful at finding 499 ways to not make a light bulb. Mm -hmm. It's about, which again, yeah, that's cognitive behavioral therapy because it it is showing the connection between the way we think about things and how we feel about things. And so in cognitive behavioral therapy, it is about, you know, inviting people to examine the way they view things and then asking, is that, is that accurate? Are you sure that's right? Where did you get that thought? Where did you get that belief? Do you really want to hold that belief anymore? As we bring that to jujitsu, I think, you know, it invites us to to examine what are we getting out of jujitsu? What do we do it for? Can we be conscious about that? I think that a lot of people go through life with the autopilot on, you know, just like when you walk up to the Coke machine and, you know, and you hit the button, you're on autopilot. Jujitsu is a great place where we can turn off the autopilot and pay attention to what's going on in our life. The neat thing about jujitsu is that if you have to think about doing a move, it's too late. You need to have practiced enough and drilled enough and, and know the sport enough that you're just reacting and you're reacting the way you want it to work. So it's this really interesting place where we can both let things happen and let things flow on the mat and be mindful about what's happening in our mind and in our body, um, in our connection with these other people. Jiu-Jitsu is one of the only times during a day for me that I can really get my head out of my ass where I'm not thinking about stress and work and stuff like that because on the mat if I'm thinking about that stuff I'm going to lose so I have to I have to teach myself nope not time to think about that it's time to be here and now it is very present for me and I think that's really healthy for a lot of people and that again is is a big part of mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy and you know being present in the moment mm-hmm. Now, if you're a coach, is there anything you can do to adopt these kinds of practices into your training and the way you teach your students? So we've talked so far about how 
students can apply this on their own and integrate this practice into their training. But is there anything a coach can do to apply the lessons of CBT to the way they operate a class, for instance? Hmm, that's a, that's an interesting question. Let me think about that for a minute. I mean, I think that inviting people to think about how they are learning this stuff and thinking about, hmm, it's not just about rewarding people for getting it right, but it's about rewarding people first for even trying Secondly, you know, successive approximations, and you know, that's where you know we teach a rat to navigate a maze, not by putting the rat in the maze and only feeding it when it gets to the end. Instead, we put the rat in the maze and we give it a little piece of cheese when it makes the first right decision, and we teach it now to make more right decisions. And we don't reward it now for making the first right decision anymore because it's already learned that. Now we want it to learn the next one and the next one and the next one. And I think we refer to it as stringing, you know, by pulling people along one decision after another, after another, after another, and connecting them. That, I think, is that's cognitive behavioral therapy in good instruction and coaching by stringing the pieces together. Yeah, on, on this podcast before I I've, I've referred to that as incremental learning and just yeah. this idea that if you're trying to teach your students you need to kind of teach them the part that they're ready to learn now and that means that you've got to kind of give them that piece of cheese one at a time like you said. I, I think an error that a lot of black belts make is they try to just knowledge dump everything they know onto their student at once and yep. that just isn't really a realistic way to learn. I mean, think about how long as a black belt it took you to learn things like an armbar to the level that you can do it now, right? When you're a white belt, trying to give them 30 details and expecting them to execute them all perfectly is just not realistic. So I try to have a little bit of restraint when I teach people. And rather than telling them every single thing I know, I try to tell them the thing that I think they're ready for mm -hmm. and then let them play with that a bit. And then when they start to hit that wall where they're ready to move on to the next part and they start to get frustrated that they don't know what they're doing anymore and they don't know how to solve this new problem they've encountered, then I'll add in that next detail detail and that next detail. Yeah. Because I think if you give people all of the info at once, I mean, we're not computers, right? You can't just download knowledge from someone else's head into your own head. You need to figure it out on your own. And so something good that an instructor can do is chunk things up into a way that's more digestible for their students. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another thought I just had, be social, you know, talk about a social issue for a minute. You know, over the past few years, we've we've been hearing a lot about you know, uh, trigger warnings and using trigger warnings and telling, you know, on NPR now, you know, whenever they're going to talk about something that includes violence or, or, you know, or a discussion of sexual assault or things like that, they'll, they'll say, you know, warning, you know, the, this story contains this content. And that came from a place of people wanting to be kind. It came from a place of not wanting to harm people or have people experience pain if they have a history of sexual assault, for instance, or or reaction to violence. And we don't want them to we don't want them to hurt as they hear this in a classroom, for instance. But that's actually really bad cognitive behavioral therapy because good cognitive behavioral therapy, in fact, with trauma history, we teach people that they can remain safe and that they can remain calm and that they can manage their feelings in that situation. They can experience and hear that stimuli and still remain present in their body and still remain, still remain safe. And, and the reason I think about that right now is that, you know, some of the most really powerful combination of jujitsu and being a psychologist I've ever been part of is doing jujitsu with particularly women who have experienced sexual assault. And the, unfortunately, you know, being in bottom position, being in guard position can be reminiscent of, you know, experiencing a sexual assault with a person over you holding you down. But the really, really powerful thing is that a person who, with that history, who is able to work through and learn jujitsu, 
learns first that they can be in that position and not be overwhelmed. They can be in that position and not lose control of their emotions. They can be in that position and now find ways to feel and be safe. It's exposure. You know, we we teach people that have a, a spider phobia, for instance, that when they run away from the spider every time they see the spider, ne- it prevents them ever learning that the spider really isn't that bad and, and, and it's not something to be all that afraid of. When we give people trigger warnings and they avoid ever experiencing those negative stimuli, they lose the ability kind of to manage the feelings that come up in response to that stimuli. So instead, we try to expose people to those negative thoughts, those negative feelings, so that they can learn, they can survive them. And the really cool thing is where jujitsu can be a part of that. Yeah, something that we've talked about on the podcast is is how, like, one of the things about jujitsu that I like is it gives people an opportunity to go into this crazy environment that's way outside of your comfort zone, right? And I think part of the reason why people purport that jujitsu is so good for building confidence is because, you know, man, if you, if you can get through a tough day of jujitsu, you can get through a lot of things, right? You know, I kind of reframed my thinking where if I had a hard day at work, I used to be able to think like, look, after this, I'm going to go onto the mats and a bunch of people are going to try to break my arm and choke me unconscious. So nothing can be harder than that. Or, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it gives yeah. you a bit of framing perspective. I'd love to learn more about this because you mentioned earlier that there's some therapeutic techniques that you employ and it sounds like you're kind of leading into this, but maybe talk a little bit about that because this sounds like a kind of a very powerful clinical approach to CBT and I definitely would want to unpack it. Was that where I mentioned acceptance and commitment therapy? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So, you know, I talked about the progression of, you know, behaviorism, kind of Skinnerian behaviorism to then cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy is kind of viewed, it's framed as kind of third wave behaviorism with with cognitive behavioral therapy being the second wave and acceptance and commitment therapy now invites us to not just pay attention to our thoughts and the connection between our thoughts and our behavior. But it now asks us to start making some distinction. And this is this is a little esoteric, but to start making a distinction between our thoughts and ourself, to recognize that I am the person having that thought, not I am that thought. So in mindfulness, we we sit there and, and we watch our thoughts go by. In acceptance and commitment therapy, when we feel a negative thought or we find ourselves feeling sad, we look at the sadness and we think, what's that about? I am experiencing sadness right now. I wonder what that's coming from. I wonder where that's going. I wonder what it's connected to. I wonder what triggered these feelings, these thoughts. There's a great kind of sort of meditation mindfulness with acceptance and commitment therapy where, you know, we invite the person to think about themselves as a flowing stream of water. And every thought that they have is a leaf and it falls into the water and then it flows away and they just kind of watch it. It now helps us to start taking a bit of a higher level perspective on who we are. I am a person right now that is experiencing sadness as opposed to I'm a sad person. It changes some things and it goes back to that that Descartes error that you know my i am not distinct from my body i am my body but i'm the person that's in the body experiencing it Mm -hmm. it's a really fascinating way of thinking because like on one hand it's about being in tune with your body but on the other hand understanding you are also not your body you are also not your brain you know they they are operating equipment that you are basically inside, (laughs) but the ability to put some distance between yourself and those thoughts, like you talked about, can be a very powerful technique for just managing mood, for having a better outlook on the world. It's all very awesome to, to explore. Yeah. And it also, it helps us realize 
that we can have thoughts, we can have feelings, we can experience them, we can honor those thoughts and feelings, but they don't have to be in charge. They don't have to be in the driver's seat. We are. Again, it's about turning off the autopilot. Yeah. So I would ask then, because you, again, you know, you know this industry, you know how jujitsu people are. They'll never ask for help, right? And one of the things about CBT is, I mean, there's a ton of pop psych books on it. There's a ton of apps you can get that purport to use CBT to help you work through your issues and build good habits. But I would want to know, you know, at what point is this something that people can play with themselves versus at what point are they going to get the best results if they go and they see a professional like yourself? You know, when when you feel like you're bumping again, same as in jujitsu, right? When you're bumping against the wall, when you're not making progress, when you can't get this move to work and you need an outside opinion, you need somebody to look at you as you're trying to do this move and tell you the piece you're missing. That's where a good therapist can can step in. I mean, and I'm I'm not an a, a typically advice giving therapist. Instead, my goal as a as a therapist is to hold up to my patient kind of a mirror and showing them, "Hey, this is this is what you look like from the outside. Does that feel accurate to you? Is that the way you want to be?" A patient I've been working with for a while the other day she came to me as a as a person with you know a lot of compartmentalization and a lot of perfectionism and she she had to be perfect in every aspect of her life but she had to be like a different in order to be perfect in every aspect of her life she had to be a different person almost in every relationship and in every interaction and you know and, and it struck me and I I've never said this to any other patient but I said you know From the outside looking in, that that sounds like an ice tray, you know, where you're little, all these different little boxes and you're a different person in every little box. What if we lowered the dividers between those different cube spots so that now the you, the water that is sloshing back and forth across all of these different cubes and you're the same person across all of them. And she came back to me last week or so, and she said, you know, when when I said that to her, it really struck. It was the most memorable thing that I ever said to her in therapy over, over two or three years of therapy. And she said, I started becoming now more mindful and able to pay attention to, am I trying to be somebody else in this situation or can I be myself? And it was neat that it stuck with her, but it gave her that perspective of what her struggles look like that now let her be aware of where she wanted to make changes. The same is true in jiu-jitsu. When, when you find yourself kind of stuck, when you find yourself doing the same thing over and over again and it's not working, that's where it's time to ask for help. Awesome. Now, on that topic of asking for help, I mean, one of the things that I, I've had the privilege of doing is talking to and getting to know a lot of high-level jiu-jitsu athletes and competitors and kind of helping them unpack, you know, on this podcast from the inside out how their mind works and how they're able to do what they do. And one of the things that, I, you know, I've discovered, as I'm sure you are also aware, is that, look, there's a lot of people in jiu-jitsu who carry a lot of pressure and a lot of negative baggage with them. You know, a lot, a lot of these athletes who perform at the highest levels, they are just, their nerves are constantly fried. They're often very unhappy. And I would love to know, you know, are, are there techniques here that, that we can unpack for those types of people? Is there anything that CBT teaches us about athletic performance and how a, like a high performing athlete can not just improve their performance, but also improve their own quality of life by using this, like things that they could employ at that kind of level? Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, sports psychologists are, are certainly implementing a lot of these kinds of techniques. I mean, again, going back to to thinking about the thinking. What are your metacognitions? Metacognitions are the thoughts we have about our thoughts. One of the things that I'm seeing in a lot of cool research is that people who have more self-compassion struggle less 
with with negative thoughts, with anxiety, with depression, and struggle less with negative behaviors. And what that's coming from is they recognize that trying to stop themselves from thinking about the pink elephant makes them think about the pink elephant. And so when they think about the pink elephant, they don't hate themselves. They don't think, oh my God, I'm such a loser. I can't control my brain. I, you know, I, I don't want to think about the pink elephant and there's the pink elephant. Instead, they think, ah, I'm human. My, my brain is this organ that does its own thing. And I can just be this person that sort of absorbs and experiences that. They can be kind to themselves. A therapist I work with has a great way of saying it. He, he invites people to question their thoughts and beliefs by asking, is that thought accurate? Is it effective in terms of doing what you want it to do? And is it kind? That, I think, is is one of the ways we start to move the dial as we live in our skin. Another a patient of mine says, you know, I try not to believe everything my brain tells me. That's great advice. I love that saying. One thing I would want to ask, too, I mean, I'm always hesitant to pump the tires too much on any idea that we promote here, right? So I'd, I'd always want to know. Are there limitations to CBT? Is there anything that, you know, as a therapist, you would say in certain situations, definitely not the tactic to use to help people? Are there any situations where it's just not the right tool that people should be aware of? Yeah, that is very fair. So, well, one interesting thing is that the effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy might be diminishing. And what we think is going on there is that as the ideas and concepts of cognitive behavioral therapy filter into normal kind of life and non-therapeutic practices, they become less novel and people actually benefit in therapy from novel ideas and treatments. So you know, one of the problems, frankly, of, of me talking about this with you is that now a somebody that listens to your show and goes into therapy and the therapist says some of this stuff, that person's going to go, no, I already heard that stuff. You need to come up with something new because that doesn't work. However, in general, cognitive behavioral therapy can be effective for a lot of a lot of people in a lot of ways. But when they are people that might have cognitive struggles, they might be psychotic, they might have intellectual disabilities or difficulties, they might have things like delusional disorder, they might be people that are older and dementing or having memory problems and things like that. Cognitive behavioral therapy isn't going to be very effective there because in fact, we can we can sometimes make things worse by taking a person whose thinking is disturbed and asking them to think about thinking. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that that's good advice. And the reason I ask is because, I mean, look, you, you know, the jujitsu community as well as I do. One of the things of, about people in this space is they cannot stop talking about jujitsu. They'll tell everyone about how jujitsu saved my life and it's the greatest thing ever. And it'll turn you into a badass and everyone should train it. And the problem with thinking about things in those terms where it's all or nothing is nothing it works a hundred percent of the time perfectly and the problem is if you tell people that something does then you give them unrealistic expectations yep. then you know if someone goes into jujitsu and they don't like it and it doesn't save their life and it doesn't turn them into a badass then you're kind of implying that there's something wrong with that person and the reality is there is no solution that's going to work a hundred percent of the time so i always want to you know mm-hmm. set expectations and make people understand that look we got a lot of tools here which of this this is one of them but that ultimately nothing is guaranteed there is no silver bullet and it's just a i think important to always talk about the other side of the coin when we share new ideas and let people know okay there there are some limitations around this it's not going to fix everything yeah and what I like to say is, you know, every, everybody's on their own path and we, we, we fit jujitsu onto ourselves, And so my jujitsu looks different than you. So we, we need to be thinking about how we're comparing. And then, you know, what you were just talking about is, is what therapists call black and white thinking. And we have to, we have to recognize that black and white thinking, it doesn't work so well. It's very attractive to people. I mean, that's why our politics are so insane right now, 
because it's all based on this all or none black and white thinking. But the reality is that most of us are in the gray zone. And the more we can recognize that we're in the gray zone and we're looking for those successive approximations, we're looking for that incremental learning, that's how we slow down and focus on progress. Fantastic. Well, before we tie this up, Dave, any closing thoughts or things you wanted to bring up that we didn't get a chance to talk about here today? No, I mean, a fun conversation. It's neat getting to talk to you about about these these kind of different worlds and how they how they come together. It's always fun. I mean, I I have lots of folks that I train with who then and you know go into therapy or now you know am in training to become therapists because they like you and I recognize that that these things these things can can mesh pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Any any resources you recommend to people? You know, if someone listened to this and they were inspired and they want to learn more, you know, maybe they're they're not a therapist and so they can't fully speak the lingo, but they're looking for like a lay person's introduction. Is there anything that you would normally steer people onto to get them involved and to get them to to start learning and practicing? Well, you know, so this is sounds silly, but you know, those dummies books that written actually by a friend of mine, Chuck Elliott, and that is really, really good and is Chuck has a couple of them on cognitive, um, uh, but there's also one by a guy named uh, Wilson. All of these are actually surprisingly accessible and pretty effective at helping people to bring some of these ideas into their life, even if they can't get into therapy. Awesome. That's a good start. But hey, if people do want to actually follow or talk to or work with a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt slash therapist slash leading sex doctor. How would they go about getting in touch with you, man? Well, I mean, right now I'm on Twitter as long as Twitter is still around. <laughs> for the next few days, at least. <laughs> yeah, for the, for the next couple of days. That, that, that's one of the places to find me at Dr. David Lay. Last name's L-E-Y. But then I have a website, uh, davidlayphd.com, is, um, and you can email me through there. Got it. Got it. Out of curiosity, do you only work with people in person or can you do remote if people are interested in uh, in connecting with you and working with you? You know, as a licensed psychologist, I can only do therapy with people that are in New Mexico or North Carolina where I'm working, where, where I'm licensed. But one of the things that I do is some consulting where I'll do an interview and, and a chat or two with people and then try to set them on the path to get therapy um, from somebody in their area. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, as always, I will put the links to all of those resources in the show notes. So if you want to check out that book or get in touch with David or follow him, just pop open your uh, podcast player, go to wherever the description in the show notes are and just one tap to get through the links. I'll also, as always, also plug a BJJ Mental Models Premium. For those who don't know, that's kind of the next tier up from just the public podcast beyond the stuff that we do here on the live feed. If you join Premium, you get uh, much more structured audio courses that break down jujitsu tactics, concepts, strategy, mindset. Uh, got a lot of great guests on there, guest teachers like John Thomas, Margot Ciccarelli, Dominica Oblanite. Got some big ones coming up soon too, so I I definitely recommend checking that out. There's also a great coaching service that we offer there too. If you join our premium, you can send us your video clips and our black belt team will review them. Really awesome value. First week is free. So please do check it out if you haven't already. If you want to do that, bjjmentalmodels.com. And again, I'll put the link in the show notes to go check that out. But David, thank you so much for coming by, man. Always appreciate having you on. I thought this was a good one. Thanks for sharing all of that knowledge. And man, best of luck training and I'll talk to you soon, okay? Talk to you soon, man. Take, take care. You too, man. And of course, everyone listening, thanks to you as well. Appreciate it greatly. And we'll talk to you next week. Take care. Bye.